back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. More specifically, this is Community Matters. And we're going to talk about a, take a scientific look at all the press we're getting on the vaccines. Just exactly how optimistic should we be? And our ch chief scientist, Mike DeWert, is here to help us uh, understand what's going on. Hi, Mike. Aloha, Jay. Good to be here. Yeah, good to have you here. You've done some research on this. You've come up with mm -hmm. charts and graphs as you always do. You, <laughs> you take a, a clear scientific um, you know, analysis of it. And um, I'm sure interested in how you feel about the vaccines and what's going on. And you know, we're having a lot of press and pomp and circumstance today on the media, but exactly how optimistic should we be, Mike? In terms of the science, we should be very optimistic. I think we've got this thing licked if we're just patient. Um, problem is the sociology. Uh, people are just much more difficult to do, deal with than the science. Um, so last time we talked about six weeks ago, um, slide one shows the graph that we were looking at then of how fast the disease was growing. Uh, we were doubling about every 10 weeks. Um, it was, uh, it, we were closing on 10 million cases. Um, uh, next, if that, you look at the next slide to see where we are now, we're, we're in a worse spot now. Um, we've, we blew past the 10 million. We're closing on a 20 million, gonna hit 20 million in the United States sometime between Christmas and New Year's, unless people drastically change their behavior. And we'll hit 30 million around inauguration day. Um, it's quite sad. Um, you know, we're doubling every seven or eight weeks now instead of every 10 weeks. Um, lucky we live Hawaii because we're not on an exponential curve in Hawaii. We've got a steady rate of about 100 cases a day now, but that could change when people travel to the mainland for the holidays and come back again. Well, how, just how good is the vaccine? I mean, they've been telling us it's 90, 95% good. And they've been telling us that um, we, we may have to take one or the other, depending on availability and logistics. Um, yeah. Should I care about which one I'm taking? Well, right now you have no choice. <laughs> right now the only <laughs> vaccine that's proven is, is approved as Pfizer's. And uh, you got to stand in the queue with the you know, first responders and the urgently uh, vulnerable people um, before it gets to you. Um, I'm probably about uh, 150 millionth in the queue. Uh, so I'm going to keep masking and social distancing. Having said that, um, the, the, this Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, which we haven't seen the data on yet because they're still applying for approval, they're very innovative, they're very new, and they were able to come up with them in record time. Uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine is a good one too, um, judging by the results, which I haven't seen the paper yet because they're still working get on their approval, completely a different technology. Um, so we're going to have choices. Um, the Pfizer one's a good one. Um, so we review um, you know, the principles of vaccines. So when I say there's rescue in sight, uh, what a vaccine does is um, it helps your immune system recognize a threat. So if your immune system encounters a threat it's seen before, it will mount a response and wipe out the threat. And it recognizes a threat by some called antigens, which are, you know, distinctive of the particular threat of virus, a bacterium, a toxin, and antibodies glom on the antigens and uh, tag them for destruction, tag whatever the antigens are attached to for destruction. So the vaccine contains a substance designed to kickstart that immune response without actually seeing the pathogen. Um, so yeah, we've, what we've about, eradicated small <clears throat> What about this thing, um, uh, mRNA? Um, that, that's new technology. That's been fairly yeah. recent, hasn't it? And what, yeah, yeah, what yeah. is remarkable about right. it? Let's go to the next slide where I talk about the types of vaccines. Mm -hmm. So um, the mRNA te technology is new. So the very first vaccine was against smallpox. And what that was was a, va a virus related to smallpox called cowpox that just happened to present the same antigens on its surface as smallpox does. So you got infected with cowpox you were immune to smallpox. And, um, and and Edward Jenner noticed that, you know, farmers and milkmaids back in England, they weren't getting the ravaged, ravaging diseases of smallpox, and it was because of this infection. Um, so we get the word vaccine from the Latin word for cow, vaca, um, because it's cowpox. So, so I, 
the nice thing about that virus was that you could make cowpox in cows. You could just infect your cattle herd and have tons of vaccine. And so we were able to wipe out smallpox sometime in the late 1950s. Um, now, you could apply a similar principle by uh, taking a virus that's dangerous, but breeding it in animals to a, to a non-dangerous form that still displays the antigens that will motivate your system. So measles is like that. The Sabin smallpox, uh, Sabin polio vaccines like that. Um, the danger for some of those vaccines, like the Sabin vaccine, will, can once in a while revert back to wild form and cause disease. So we're this close to wiping out polio. We've wiped out one out of the three strains. So because of the danger of reversion, we've taken that strain we've wiped out out of the vaccines worldwide. So now that we're only vaccinated it's two strains of polio. And those strains both have more mutations to get back to the wild state, so they're safer. I remember reading that in around the turn of the 19th century, <clears throat> namely uh, around the year 1800, they had they had inoculations. They had some kind of sure. primitive vaccines. What was that about? Well, now an inoculation is related to the um, use of a, a live virus. So the Chinese, as I understand, invented inoculation for smallpox. They found that if you took, if you inhaled smallpox or ingested it, you would get a systemic disease that would ravage your lungs and kill you, in, possibly. But if you took a little bit of smallpox and put a scratch on someone's skin and then covered it up with a bandage, the scratch would blister, and that person would be contagious for a while, but they would not get a whole body systemic infection. So once the smallpox blister on the scratch healed, they were immune. And so this saved the U.S. Army in the Revolutionary War. The armies of Europe were ravaged by smallpox, but the U.S. Army had learned to go and inoculate their soldiers. So you would have to be quarantined for a couple of weeks in your barracks while the inoculation took effect. But the um, doctor would go to the village, find somebody whose smallpox was a mild case, uh, ask them how much they wanted for samples of their smallpox, and he would just pop their blisters and take samples. Then he would take it to the barracks very carefully, of course, and um, inoculate the new recruits. And so that conferred immunity. Now, that's, of course, dangerous because you've got to handle smallpox like it's a serious biohazard, which it is. So, uh, so modern vaccinations are safer than inoculation. Vaccinations you don't use the actual virus the way inoculation did. So the um, thing about the mRNA, so all the vaccines that we have so far, you either have to breed a virus that's similar that presents antigens, or you have to do a, a mutation with a called recombinant DNA thing where you add antigens to a harmless virus. Now the Novavax virus does that. It takes a cold virus that chimpanzees get and adds to it a gene that makes the spike protein for COVID-19 so that it presents to the immune system the spike protein, so the immune system reacts to that, learns to recognize that, but it doesn't cause much of an illness in humans. It's a harmless virus in humans. So that's an adenovirus, it's harmless in humans. And that's the AstraZeneca one. There's a conventional technology. It's amazing they got it working as quickly as it did. The, the new mRNA vaccine, so what messenger RNA, mRNA does is your body's DNA is confined to the nucleus of the cell. It never leaves the nucleus. And when your body needs proteins or something made from the instructions of that DNA, the DNA unwraps a little bit, a piece of messenger RNA comes, grabs the instructions from the DNA, takes it out of the nucleus to cell factors called ribosomes. The ribosomes are like little 3D printers that make whatever that R messenger RNA is to them as a as an RNA is you if you instead of taking your own natural DNA, you take messenger RNA and inject it, and that messenger RNA has the instructions for the smallpox for the uh, COVID-19 spike protein. It teaches your own ribosomes to make that spike protein and your immune system recognizes it doesn't belong and it starts to mount a response to that spike protein. So you're turning your own cells into the factories for the messenger RNA and cutting out a whole bunch of work that would normally have to be done to make that, to make that spike protein antigen. So you're teaching your own body to prepare it to make its own vaccine, essentially. So well, it's quite I, a great really, technology. It really, it really is that they came up with it and actually deployed it so quickly. But uh, you know, what strikes me is that you have this, um, uh, well, I guess it's uh, molecular 
process they have they have uh, found and, and and implemented. Um, you could mm -hmm. use it on other viruses, right? Oh, you could absolutely. Use it on other diseases. You it's it's like creating a little machine in there uh, that will do what you want. You tell it what to do, it'll do it. That's quite amazing. Yeah. 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 The beauty of this thing is once you have sequenced the DNA of a pathogen and you sequenced the DNA appropriate to the antigens that will let your immune system recognize it, you can now crank up a DNA factory that then can be used to make messenger RNA without having to pass it through a cow or an egg or some bio reactor. You can make massive quantities of this quickly. So now they were going slow with the messenger RNA technology until this crisis came along. Yeah. So this COVID-19 sort of kicked the whole thing back into high gear. Yeah. And here we are. We've got a new technology now that, uh, as we'll see when we get to the numbers, is pretty safe and very effective. So why why do you have to have two shots? What's that all about? So, 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 well, again, I, again, get, get, get a little bit ahead here, but the uh, first shot does provoke an immune response. They've shown that within about two weeks of getting the first shot, your body has made enough has enough immune response to start making you immune to COVID. They give you the second shot because they want to make sure the antibodies get up to at least where somebody who has gotten COVID and, and gotten through it has. So that's just sort of a, the second shot is a kicker to make sure that the antibody response is at full strength. So the first shot does confer some immunity. Um, and that's one of the questions that they have to deal with when the rollout. What if people come for the first shot and then don't bother coming back for the second? How do yeah. we handle that case? Yeah. Do we need to handle that case? Yeah. yeah. Do we? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know. They're going to they're going to do some follow ups. They've only had two months of follow up on most of the patients in the trial. They're going to do more follow up and see uh, how one shot. I mean, the people that didn't come back for the second shot, try to cap, find them and see how well they did. Um, but we know the two shots are very effective. Um, the the other thing that um, that uh, you wonder about is uh, what's with the low temperature? Why do you have to freeze it at uh, what is it seventy nine minus seventy nine yeah. centigrade? It's pretty yeah. cold. Uh, yeah, why, yeah. why 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 so high? Well, messenger RNA in your cells only has to go from the nucleus to the ribosome. It doesn't have to go very far. So nature didn't really design it to hang around long. It's a fragile uh, entity. Um, so to keep it from falling apart just in heat, you got to make it very cold. And they also encapsulate it with chemicals that also protect it from the environment. Um, so now, having said that, dry ice isn't that cold. You can go down to the wharf and buy bags of dry ice or blocks of dry ice mm -hmm. you know, for your parties or for your uh, Halloween you know, steam smoke machine display or whatever. <laughs> in the first world here, it's not a big deal. Uh, it's cold, but it's not you know, outrageously cold with modern technology. Yeah. So, so how do you get it that cold? How do you get it to minus seventy? Um, I mean, what, 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 your dry ice is probably by itself not going to do that. You need. Uh, well, dry ice does. Oh, no, dry ice will it do does. that. Dry ice will do that. Yeah, okay. Do, yeah, that's, and that's one of the provisions they have that they're building boxes that you can add dry ice to to preserve the vaccine. Um, if it's going to take you a while to get to a site where you can put a proper multi-stage refrigerator. And, yeah. you know, all our house, most of our hospitals in Hawaii have this refrigeration capability. And the ones that don't are working to get it. Um, and, and the dry ice is you just go down to the wharf and buy it and put it in the, put it in the box and that works. So we've heard a lot about how over this weekend, you know, they were getting all the trucks ready uh, at yeah. the Pfizer manufacturing facility and, moving them to airplanes and flying them across the country. It's impressive. And it reminds me of that yeah. uh, retired or actually armed uh, the uh, active duty general that uh, the administration put in charge of the delivery system, the logistics general. Yeah. Um, but, but query, yeah. um, you know, is that going to work? I mean, as I think right now people are watching it carefully. The media is watching it, watching it carefully. Is it, I, I will know the answer. Sure in a few days, of course, but is it going to work? I think it'll work. I mean, it's just a logistics problem. You know, Amazon's mastered this. Uh, so I would hope the U.S. Army could master it. Um, <laughs> it's whether people will show up for the vaccine. Okay. You know, 
Let's talk about that. Right. Let's talk about, you know, the, so the, the sequence is uh, priorities. And uh, I'm a little right. confused on the priority. Who's setting the priorities? On the one hand, you hear the uh, federal government, Trump, um, trying to set priorities. On the other hand, he's saying, no, the states will set priorities. And then you get sort of get this gestalt feeling. Well, the first thing is the health care providers. The second yeah. thing is the people who are vulnerable in care homes. The third thing yeah. is people who are essential workers and so forth. And, and you see it in the paper, but is that the law? Is, uh, who decided that and, and why? You know? Well, the CDC makes the recommendations, but the states can set their own priorities. And they may or may not follow the Center for Disease Control. But it makes sense to vaccinate the healthcare providers because they get exposed to hundreds of people every day who may be sick, may have this disease. It makes sense to vaccinate the very vulnerable populations in the nursing homes. We've seen in school to be they off in the nursing homes. So it makes sense to prioritize the vaccines that way. Then past that, who's next? Uh, yeah. Well, why, why you know, uh, Trump Trump was going to have his, his entire White House staff vaccinated, you know. Um, that was the first news over the weekend, that he was arranging to have his entire White House vaccinated. But then he uh, he backed that off, uh, walked that back yeah. and said, no, I was only kidding. Um, uh, we're not going to we're not going to, you know, take priority over the others um, uh, that are on the CDC priority list. Um, so the question, um, is there anything yeah. that would justify him jumping the list? Um, why do that? Is, isn't he a very essential person? Uh, I mean, theoretically. Well, he's already had the disease, so he's probably immune. What about all the people in the so, White House? Well, that's so. So here's here's the issue. Here, well, here's what I understand: is you know you you, you can be, appear to be jumping the queue, or you can appear to be setting a good example. So if you've got celebrities saying, "Hey, I rolled up my sleeve and got the vaccine," you should too. That that's a good example for people who might otherwise be vaccine resistant um, or hesitant. Um, on the other hand, it could also be, oh, the rich people get all the best health care first. You know, the rest of us have to stand in line. Um, <laughs> you got to balance those, balance those problems. You know, now somebody, uh, somebody elderly who's a celebrity, I don't know, maybe Jim Carter, yeah, or uh, uh, some elderly celebrities could just say, hey, I'm near the top of the queue because I'm old and I'm going to roll up my sleeve and get this vaccine. That would help a lot. Well, part of this is to encourage the, the masses out there to take the vaccine. I'm reminded of a vaccine, I, maybe it was measles, yeah. I think, back when. And they got uh, Elvis Presley to take it. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, millions of people took it uh, yeah. because it was yeah. Elvis. He was their hero. Yeah. So if you get a celebrity hero person, yeah. that's going to encourage. So it's worth putting him at the top of the, at the, top of the list to, to achieve that secondary effect. You know, I have a question over here, a question from a viewer. Should we be worried that richer countries will get access to the vaccines um, earlier than others? Won't vaccines not work unless, and this is the second question. Uh, let, me, let me ask the first one. Or should we be worried that richer countries will get it first? We should be worried that richer countries will get it first because it does set about to, the problem is if everybody in the world isn't safe from this virus, nobody's really safe. You know, you well, want to have the vaccine. vaccine I'm safe, virus. am I not? If I have the vaccine, why do I care about what happens in northern India? Well, not everybody can be vaccinated. You know, the trials excluded people who are immunocompromised, excluded people who are allergic to other vaccines. And those two groups already can't be vaccinated. No, but if I'm if I'm vaccinated, I don't I don't care. If the guy down the block is going to get sick or not, I don't care. If me but and you my do family, care if your doctor gets sick, huh? You do care if your doctor gets sick. You do <laughs> care if your family gets sick, and unless you're a complete loner with no family and no friend. I mean, you 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 care if the firefighters that might have to save your burning house get sick. You care if the cops that might have to save your life get sick. You you care you got you care about these things, you know, whether you know it or not. Yeah. Um, you care about whether the grocery store clerk you go see every you know, week for groceries dies of it. Um, why, why do I care about somebody in um, northern India? Yeah. Well, why do I, why we I, have I care a, about yeah. I don't know.
I mean, I care because I know we have a global interconnected economy. And you know, here in Hawaii, we care because our economy depends on tourism. If people from the rest of the world don't come here, we continue to struggle and starve. So we need to get tourism back up as soon as we can here in Hawaii. And that means having people all over the world vaccinated, safe, and ready to come spend their money okay. here. I'll take your point. Okay, next, next part of that question. Won't vaccines not work? This is part of the same answer, I think, unless everyone gets vaccinated at the same time. In other words, if we have rolling vaccinations around the world, um, is that as good as if we got everybody vaccinated within a short period of time? Oh, it'd be better to get everybody vaccinated, but it's not necessary. We certainly don't see that with measles or polio. I mean, polio was wiped out in the United States well before it was wiped out in India. Um, uh, and that vaccination campaign is still going on in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, once you've achieved a certain percentage of a population in a country that's been vaccinated and is therefore immune, you greatly reduce the chance that disease will spread in that country. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we have sporadic outbreaks of measles in the United States because there's people who refuse to get the vaccine or refuse to let their kids be vaccinated. So once we'll get an outbreak, but it doesn't spread throughout the whole country because they're isolated pockets of, of um, vulnerability. Yeah, so well, this, is, this is worth yeah. studying. It's worth getting data about this and studying it. Speaking of which, you have more charts and graphs. I have more questions. Why don't you do your charts and graphs before I do my questions? <laughs> okay, well, uh, we, you know, the next chart was just um, pointers to, um, it says um, Pfizer COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. It just gives you this locations where you can find the uh, FDA report as well as the peer-reviewed paper or the first page of the peer of summary page of the peer-reviewed papers there. But I'll summarize some of these things. The thing on this chart that's uh, interesting is just how the ethnicities. This Pfizer vaccine was tested in the United States, Germany, South Africa, and Turkey are the primary sites. So the population tested was overwhelmingly uh, white, but there were a significant amount of African people of African origin tested as well. Mm. And then a lot of Hispanics, um, and then not as many Asians. I'd like to see more Asians um, in this data set, um, but that's, you know, that, that will come as they do more follow on studies. And they've got to follow up with the vaccine. Everybody that they're supposed to follow up um, the people that are vaccinated out in the world and see how they're doing, you know, as months and years go on and make sure there aren't any long-term side effects. So the follow-up with that. The next page is on efficacy. Um, if you look at all the groups lumped together, um, it's like not, almost 95% effective at preventing this disease, COVID-19. Um, and there were a lot of people in the placebo group, there was, you know, almost, there was almost 19,000 cases. In the vaccine group, there's 19,000 cases. There were nine cases of the disease in the vaccine group and 169 in the placebo group. I mean, this vaccine really knocked down your chances of getting the SARS, the COVID-19 disease. Um, people, young people, it was 95% effective. Old people was 94% effective. Women, 94% effective. Men, 95% effective. This is a very effective vaccine overall. Well, you're asking me to, to believe them though. Um, if, if I have trust problems with uh, the CDC or with the CDC resisting political influence, uh, then maybe, maybe that uh, data is que more questionable. Maybe the conclusions and recommendations. For example, when, when uh, Pfizer came out with it, they said, good news, this is 90% effective. And a couple of days later, who was it? Moderna came out and said, we're 94.5% effective. And then right after that, Pfizer came out, well, okay, well, in fact, we were kidding you. We are 95%, we're better than Moderna. Yeah. And I'm saying, yeah. gee, that's an interesting switch of, uh, you know, of scientific opinion in a matter of three days. So how, how credible are these numbers? Um, should I believe these numbers? Should I believe the people who are vetting and analyzing these numbers? Well, these numbers are credible. Um, so this vaccine trials go through multiple stages where they go through a small stage for safety than a larger stage, phase two, or a little bit more safety and efficacy than phase three, which is what we just been through for real efficacy testing. Um, 
So at the smaller stages, your statistics aren't as good. So the error bars are bigger and you don't want to quote too optimistically. Um, but this vaccine, you know, with 40,000 people almost, you know, in the trial, um, they've pretty well tested efficacy, at least in white people, black people, Hispanic people. Um, they need better statistics in Asians, Native Americans, Pacific Islanders. Um, if you think there's a reason for those people to have different immune responses than African Americans and white people, um, let me, let me, and, uh, and it's worth doing those studies, and they will. Yeah. But those studies so, are after the vaccine is uh, actually distributed out there. Those well, studies. The trials are, are, yeah. Go ahead. Well, both, both. The trial is still going on. The formal clinical trial is still going on. On, and they're following up the people in that trial. And they're also having to follow the people who have gotten this emergency use authorization vaccine. Now, you don't have to trust just the company or just the Food and Drug Administration. The paper is being submitted to a scientific journal, New England Journal of Medicine, and it will be peer reviewed. And right now it's published already in advance of the peer review, but the peer reviewers are gonna jump all over this and go through all these data with a fine tooth comb and find all the things that, you know, all the seams that there might be in it. You mm -hmm. don't have to trust just one group. It's, you know, there's many people who, who are ready to, you know, review these data, and make sure they're good. And we'll see the same thing with the Moderna vaccine when they, when they publish and with the AstraZeneca vaccine and all the vaccines when they're, when they are publishing their data. Um, any flaw in the methodology will be picked apart. So I, there are two things we, we should uh, touch upon before, before we go. Number, number one is uh, the, the complacency phenomenon. I mean, the, pre the press has been pounding us with how effective these, uh, these uh, vaccines are. And uh, yeah. surely some people will be profoundly affected by that. And they'll, and they'll take chances now because they, they feel you know, impervious because they, they could have one, one of these days, maybe months later, <laughs> They, they would have uh, access to the vaccine. The other people, the other problem is the ones who, you know, uh, the anti-vaxxers who feel that it's a violation of uh, their constitutional rights to take a vaccine. They don't care if they infect other people uh, for one reason or another, including religious reasons. Uh, they don't plan to take the vaccine and they don't want to have their children take the vaccine. And, and if, if God strikes them with, with, with the virus, uh, that'll be that. Um, you know, they accept the, the fate of that, of that event. So <clears throat> both of those things work against the successful deployment of the, vi of the vaccines. Um, how is that gonna work out? Do you have any thoughts on it? Well, you know, we managed to get polio eradicated in the United States, and we managed to get smallpox eradicated in the United States. And I, you know, when people, so what will help is when schools require the vaccine. Right now, you already have to have a bunch of vaccines to go to school. Mm -hmm. Military requires you to be vaccinated. You gotta have your shots to join the army. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if government service requires you to be vaccinated, then, and, and your employer, or your employer's insurer can require you to be vaccinated. So those are, but those are sort of coercive things. What will really help is this uh, positive pressure. Every, all your friends are getting it. All your family is getting it. All your neighbors are getting it, something like that. All these celebrities are getting the vaccine. Uh, everybody's doing it. You should do it too. Um, yeah, appealing to the common good, fortune doesn't always work out. Right. But, um, you know, the, but some things will work out. I mean, for example, if I'm an employer and uh, employee number A gets the uh, vaccine, employee number B doesn't, and the employer does nothing about that, um, you know, employee, employee number C, who would like to get the vaccine, hasn't gotten it yet, uh, now he gets sick, he sues the employer for not failing to protect him. And he says that the duty of care that the employer has to every employee is to require that person to, you know, if he's going to work next to, you know, our plaintiff, uh, the duty of care requires the employer to make sure that everybody in, in the place has the vaccine. I, I think that's a case that will happen. Uh, and, I, and that just the prospect of that case makes it clear that every right thinking employer in the country is going to require it. And if you want to take a chance, fine, but on your own time, 
you're out um, and we're not going to hire you or we're going to fire you. Yeah. And then there'll be questions well, about awful termination. <laughs> it's a tough, tough choice. I mean, I, I didn't have to go through a test whether I had the um, uh, polio vaccine to get a job or whether I had ever had tuberculosis to get a job. I didn't have to. But with this kind of a thing, you can see that happening. You can see employers start to require it. You can see airlines especially requiring their employees to get the vaccine. Anybody place where you see a lot of people facing customers all day long um, could require that. Um, one, one interesting thing that, that, I, that I saw was that they're, they're in, somebody, I don't know who it is, a drug company, uh, I'm not sure it's the government, but somebody is inventing a shot record card. In the military, sure. that's what you have. I think in schools too, oh, yeah. you have a shot record yeah. card, which demonstrates and evidences that you had this shot, that shot, and so forth. Well, um, yeah. I think that's yeah. going to become de rigueur uh, all over the country. Yeah. And if you can't present a sure. shot record card showing you had the vaccine, you, you know, you're not going to have a lot of privileges. Yeah. Well, yeah, that could happen. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, my dad was in the Air Force. We traveled to Libya. We uh, had to show our vaccination cards. And we had all our immunizations when we went there and when we came back. Um, and I didn't see that. I don't think my parents saw those owners. Now, when I was a kid, um, the measles vaccine was new and I got measles, measles in Libya and my ears still ring from that infection. Now, luckily, I didn't get any more serious side effects, a little bit of deafness. Um, but uh, yeah, people don't realize how important vaccines are now. We're so com we're so lucky in the United States to have all these vaccines already. So, you know, the big question is those those people who are anti-vaxxers and those people who are anti-mask and social distancing, they're going to be really on the other side of public health. They're they're going to be, uh, you know, I mean, it, it yeah. struck me, it struck me funny, for example, that all these shipments that went out with the vaccines yesterday and today had heavy security. Why oh, heavy yeah. security? Why heavy security? Because I think there are people out there who would like to sabotage them. Uh, or, or at least that. <laughs> well, ah, there you go. <laughs> uh, worth a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, they're, they are worth, yeah, you know, they're, I mean, they're only being sold for like $20 a dose, but, you know, the box is a thousand doses. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and you can see where some of these people, I mean, there are side effects with every vaccine. I mean, most of the, most of the side effects of this disease is your arm will be sore for a couple of days and you might feel crappy for a couple of days. You might have a, a headache. You might have some muscle aches, some maybe fever, maybe chills. You're gonna. The most common side effects are that you have these kinds of chills, muscle aches, um, not serious, and it's only a couple of days, and then you're immune to a disease that could kill you. Um, there have been a couple of cases in Britain where somebody who had had uh, a, a um, allergic reaction, a severe allergic reaction to other vaccines, was also allergic to this one. So the that's why they're excluding people who had severe allergic reactions. I don't think that was to the actual vaccine, but to the uh, polyethylene glycol used as a preservative. And polyethylene glycol is in everything. It's in toothpaste. It's in some soft drinks. It's in uh, a lot of uh, uh, shampoos and commercial products. Um, it's got a whole bunch of industrial uses. And it's also used as a preservative in some kinds of medications, in particular this Pfizer vaccine. Now. So people will glom onto these rare problems or to the common annoying side of it. Like, I'm not and I don't want to feel crappy for instance. It's like, okay, um, your choice. Um, yeah, and clearly choice. some people like pregnant women, they, didn't, they, they excluded pregnant women from the trials. So they can't vaccinate pregnant women right now because they don't know. Now, 23 women did get pregnant accidentally during the trial between the first and second dose. So they're going to follow them and see how things go. Um, so far, there's no problems in the vaccine arm. They've had some problems in the placebo arm, which, of course, are unrelated to the vaccine. So, um, it's. Oh, what, what are the chances? What are the chances, Mike, that um, you know that this this will serve as a, a kind of trial? Aside from the you know the, the scientific trials, uh, yeah. phase phase three, phase yeah. whatever. Um, that the actual use, distribution of the yeah. of the vaccines will be a trial. But watching and following up, and every every single person who takes the vaccine, they'll be 
calling him, how are you feeling, and, and trying to figure out what happened. And, and then that means to me um, that they'll have an opportunity uh, to, to fix any problems with it. Am I right yeah. about this? Yeah, exactly. They're required to follow up. You know, they may not track you down and ask you how it's going, but you know, if you come back and say, I got this vaccine, and I feel like I got this problem, that problem, the other problem, they have to follow up. You go to your doctor and say, I feel crappy I, ever since I had this vaccine. They have to follow up and they're required to follow up. So this is still going to be a trial that the data will be used to uh, really track down the long-term you know, effects of this vaccine, both positive and negative. And they want to track it down because in the trial, they only had two months of immunity data. There doesn't seem to be any waning of immunity after two months. They really would like this immunity to last a year or more. So they're going to keep following people. Yeah, nobody knows how long the immunity will last. Huh? Yeah, I mean, so far there's no sign after two months of it tapering off. Um, it's, you know, and the group had two doses of the vaccine, um, which is a good sign because if it was only going to last six months, you'd think you'd start to see some sort of tapering off after two months. Um, but yeah, they've got to follow up. Yeah. Um, so would you take it if it was available to you right now, Mike? Absolutely. I mean, me, I'm, I'm a caregiver for, for a dementia patient. I can't risk her getting it. So I would go get the disease. I mean, I get the vaccine and then take her in to get her vaccine. Yeah. That's what I would do. Uh, uh -huh. I'd make sure that I'm not going to be a carrier of the disease. Then I would do everything I can to make sure that she didn't get the disease. So it's going to be so much about this, how it unfolds, you know, about what we learn in the process and, yeah. and, and who is asking for what and who should get what and, and when and how the effects are. It's really the most interesting public health question we've ever had. So. Yeah, and it's going to be more like it, you know. Yeah. This, yeah, this vaccine evolved from an animal. I mean, this virus evolved from an animal virus. Smallpox originally started out as horsepox and mutated to become a human infectious disease. So this is not the first time it's happened. It's not going to be the last time it's happened. No. So, yeah. But it's the most sophisticated time it's happened. <laughs> we are so lucky to live in a time when it's even conceivable to develop a vaccine in a year. By the yeah. time this is over, if we're just patient hang on, this is going to be a year and a half, almost two years of ag in the United States. You know, if we just social distance, wear our masks, don't give each other the virus until we can all get vaccinated, then the 1918 pandemic will be the worst one we had. I mean, I'm not optimistic that our citizens will do that, but I can hope. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. So everybody should just avoid traveling, and and, and it's interesting. Chinese just issued a warning to their flight attendants: don't use the labs on the airplane that you're your flight attendant on. You know, wear diapers, anything. Don't use the lab. It's like what? It's because the labs volatilize the virus particles. Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, we're going to learn so much, and you and I are going to discuss it all. Uh, thank you, Mike. It's great yeah. to talk to you about this. Yeah. Great to, to, yeah. to push the frontier on where it's going. They say, wear your mask, wash your hands, don't travel. <laughs> Got it. Mike DeWert, our chief scientist, thank you so much for joining us today. Nice to you, Jay. Thank you. Aloha.